Is there real evidence for life after death? The accepted scientific view is that life is ended by death. However, some scientists have for many years investigated claims that consciousness survives. But if people can continue to exist separated from their bodies, where are the signs of this possibility among the living? Do we have elements of personality capable of surviving death? In other words, is there a paranormal dimension to life? Many people believe in the paranormal. A Gallup poll in 1990 said three quarters of Americans and half of all Europeans accepted some form of life after death. One in four Westerners even believe in reincarnation, but believing is not evidence in itself. It may just be an indication that many people feel there's more to life than physical existence. Have you ever felt an awareness of God? Yes, I can say that. Have you ever felt an awareness that you were in the presence of someone that died? Yes, I think I can say that I have felt that. It was my mother, though. I felt that she was at the bottom of the bed. I woke up one night and uh, it was something at the bottom of the bed. My granddad died before I was born, but, yeah, I do get a feeling from that. Just a feeling inside. I mean, you, you can never prove it, I don't think. Uh, some people have more real feelings. I just feel a little bit that she's still alive in some way. Good morning. The Gallup organization may I help you. Large numbers of people not only believe in paranormal phenomena uh, and, and in psychic phenomena, but actually in many cases they themselves have uh, experienced uh, something in the area of the paranormal. Those are not necessarily the traditionally religious experiences, but the broad range of experiences have happened on a very immediate and personal level to nearly half of the populaces of the United States and Great Britain. Today, some scientists say a belief in the paranormal can be supported by evidence. A leading investigator is Professor Ian Stevenson, a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia. He's examined claims of reincarnation and life after death for 30 years. I think science should pay a lot more attention to this problem, to the evidence that we have, imperfect as it is. It's uh, if looked at fairly. I think it's uh, extremely impressive. And the evidence comes from a variety of sources, from children who remember previous lives, certain instances of apparitions, and people who come close to death and recover. So there is a variety of evidence from uh, several different sources pointing toward a life after death, and I think it deserves a great deal more investigation. The idea that people can survive without their bodies has been researched in many countries. Hundreds of sightings of apparitions have been documented and analyzed. There's a survey of widows in which more than half claim some encounter with their dead partners. In another report, hospital doctors and nurses said many dying patients believe they saw apparitions come to take them to the next world. CICU, get a bed down there, please. She's Best documented of all are surveys in scientific journals of thousands of patients brought back from the brink of death by modern medicine. Many say they experienced another dimension of existence. Well, how's April doing today? Dr. Melvin Morse investigated hundreds of these near-death experiences in adults and children. He's convinced they're not simply hallucinations. What I found in children is a common core experience that virtually all children have and this core childhood experience consists of leaving the physical body seeing their own body below them with people attempting to resuscitate them entering into a world of darkness and then encountering a beautiful brilliant light a light that they often associate with love or as one patient told me there are a lot of good things in that light 
The Eastern belief in reincarnation is another aspect of the evidence we shall look at later in this series. The Dalai Lama of Tibet is a famous example. He is believed to have lived before, as all 13 previous Dalai Lamas. All the children in this Buddhist ceremony are said to be reincarnations of dead monks. The East has its own view of death. In Tibetan Buddhism, we believe rebirth theory. Therefore, that means one way, like changing clothes. But it's the person remain continuously. I think life has certain limitation. Therefore, this body, which cannot remain permanently, at a certain time, it has to change. However, the person or the being, the continuation of the subtle consciousness, so that always remain continuously. So anyway, something like, is it taking, I'm changing, I'm taking new clothes and abandon the, what is the old cloth. Reincarnation is rejected by the vast majority of scientists. So are other forms of life after death. Science takes the materialist view. Life is destroyed by death. With regards to life after death, you want to be very clear what question you're asking. If you're asking a scientific question, then you're tied up with genes, uh, hereditary factors, brains, uh, bodies, and it's quite clear that they don't survive. Now, if you're talking about subjective experience, then you are asking a non-scientific question, and the answer will be non-scientific. Now, there is no reason why personal experience in some form or other shouldn't continue. It's a classical scientific debate. Are we machines made of flesh, controlled by a brain acting like a computer, with everything collapsing at death? Or do we have an extra dimension, an aspect of personality called mind? The assumption is that when your brain dies, your mind perishes also. Uh, that is, is so deeply believed that uh, scientists fail to understand that it is, in the end, an assumption only. And uh, there's no reason uh, why aspects of the mind shouldn't survive the death of the brain. But uh, uh, to shake that belief among uh, scientists of today is extremely difficult. If any aspect of the living can survive death, it's likely to be mind. But do we have this potential? We looked at people who claim to reach beyond the range of physical senses. Six, one. Some of the most famous tests for the paranormal were carried out at Duke University in America over 50 years ago. The subject is trying to predict and influence the role of dice. In charge at Duke was Professor J.B. Rhine, who devised these Xena cards to measure telepathy or ESP. The subject tries to guess each card as it comes off the pack. Five symbols in a pack of 25 means you should get five right by guesswork alone. ESP is never judged on a single test. The subject should get more than five correct on average over a long series of tests. You got one circle, three crosses, Two ways. At Duke, they claim to have demonstrated that ESP was real. Certainly, some people got more than five right. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's marvelous. The modern name for telepathy is psi. The most successful psi experiments are Gansfeld tests. Here, Tessa Cordell of the BBC, who claims no psi powers, is being prepared for a test. Half ping pong balls cover her eyes, and headphones will eliminate other distractions. 
In another room, a volunteer randomly selects a set of four slides and puts one in a projector. Telepathically, he tries to transmit this image. Okay. Tessa, with no knowledge of any of the slides, will describe what she sees in her mind's eye. Afterwards, she'll be shown all four pictures. Only if she can pick the target slide is the test a hit. The odds are four to one, she might get it right by guesswork. So there'll be a series of tests. In the past, other subjects have scored impressive hits. I have an image of a volcano with uh, molten lava inside the crater, or molten lava running down the side of a volcano. Now I think of the water as a way of putting out flames. And suddenly I was biting my lip as though lips had something to do with imagery, and I see lips out in front of me. And the lips I see are bright red, reminding me of flame imagery earlier. There have now been 39 Gunsfeld studies reported over the last 15 years involving this particular methodology. Uh, these studies have been conducted by investigators in 14 different laboratories and involve uh, almost 1,200 individual trials. The overall average success rate is 34%, where 25% is what would be expected by chance. So there's a, a 9% overall deviation from what would be expected purely by coincidence, and that result is enormously significant. The odds against chance are in the trillions to one, and even critics of parapsychology now acknowledge that these results cannot be attributed to chance. Tessa's target in the Gansfeld test we recorded was a flock of birds. For 30 minutes, she recorded her impressions. A shooting star, a comet, something moving through the sky downwards. It's a house like a Hansel and Gretel house, like a wooden house with a pointy roof. There were a number of very different images. Later, Tessa was asked to place the pictures in order from the most likely target to the least likely. This would be considered a direct miss. This is, she scored the correct target as low as possible. Um, and any particular trial um, like this one is only an anecdote in itself, even if she had gotten a direct hit. It seemed a total failure until Dr. Sondo compared Tessa's statements with the other three slides. ESP displacement is the name for psi directed slightly off target. Compare Tessa's statements not so much with the slide of birds, but with the other three slides. A point, like a metal railing with a point. A wide open mouth, like a, like a shark's mouth, with pointed teeth, like something out of jaws. Waves like surfing waves. The front of a ship, like a Viking ship. The pointing part of the ship that used to look like a bird. An eye, eyelashes, a very big eye, like right up close to a, a Buddha's eye, it's closed. Were we to get a whole series of numerous examples of what looks like naming um, various aspects of the pack, we could um, uh, test this statistically by comparing it, uh, having an independent judge um, comparing her imagery to this whole pack versus another pack selected at random. These four pictures were drawn randomly for comparison. None matched anything Tessa had said, but the slides in the original test were much closer. The Viking ship and the Buddha were named directly. As a Gansfeld test, it was a miss, but an intriguing one. A dragon's tail. The best results that we've obtained involve students uh, from the Juilliard School of Performing Arts in New York City, which is one of the world's leading uh, performing arts centers. And students there are, are extremely highly uh, selected on the basis of artistic ability. They produced a 50% success rate. And an example uh, here would be the subject who is talking continuously throughout the session about men with beards. And there's a man with a dark beard and he's got a sharp face. There's another man with a beard. Now there's green and white. 
I can see him from behind, and I can see his hat, and he has a sack over his shoulder, and it's like for apple seeds that he's strewing around. The window ledge is looking down, and there's a billboard that says Coca-Cola on it. And there's a snowman again, and it's got a carrot for a nose and three black buttons coming down the front. Well, this was a Coca-Cola advertisement. This is the only session out of 355 where the subject actually mentioned Coca-Cola. He does not mention Santa Claus. It is not a, an absolutely exact literal hit, but it has many elements, including the three buttons running down the front of Santa Claus's suit. Uh, the time of year is picked up in the reference to the snowman and, and so on. In the past, the kinds of targets that have been used in ESP experiments have been pretty dull. We found a much stronger result when uh, senders were viewing movie clips or documentary sequences than when they were viewing static pictures. A cat, and then a black panther, and then some shots from um, Life on Earth, as the, uh, the part about the, the African plains and the lions hunting, and a black panther going stealthily through jungle. The subject uh, started by getting an image of a cat, and this transformed into her memory of having seen this particular episode of Life on Earth. In other words, she actually named the target, and she had no idea, uh, nor did anyone else except for the sender, what the actual target would be. So here we have uh, an indication that there is actual communication of information going on. Some vertical object bending or swaying almost something swaying in the wind uh, wheat perhaps some some thin vertical object swaying bending to the left some kind of ladder ladder like structure but that seems to be almost blowing in the wind almost like a ladder like bridge over a uh, some kind of chasm that's that's waving in the wind this is not vertical, this is horizontal. Bridge, a drawbridge over something. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's like one of those old English type bridges that uh, opens up, opens up from either side at the middle. The middle part comes up. I see it opening. It's opening. It would appear if size is real that we have capabilities that extend beyond the nervous system as we currently understand it, that is able in some way, currently not understood, to uh, uh, obtain knowledge, uh, information from a distance, sometimes even from the future. And if these claims are, are, are correct, as we believe at least some of them are, then uh, this casts an, an entirely different light on how we view uh, the nature of man and his place in the physical world. The newest training ground for investigators of Psi is in Scotland at Edinburgh University. In recent years, opportunities for Psi research have diminished in the West where half the research centers have closed through lack of funds. At Edinburgh, Professor Bob Morris sees to it that today's parapsychologists take a rational view of evidence for the paranormal. We are charged to investigate what have been called claims of the paranormal, specifically the claim that certain people apparently have the ability to interact with their environment through new means, ways that we don't presently understand. Some of the experiments we're conducting at the moment are attempting to understand more about how we can be deceived or deception how people can uh, mistakenly observe things, how their basic framework understanding uh, or their beliefs can make them miss certain things, exaggerate the importance of certain others, and so on. In some respects, this even is uh, the, the study of, uh, of magic. One of the students is encouraged to develop his skills as a close-up conjurer. The first thing to know when investigating someone who claims psychic powers is how to spot a fake. We're focusing a lot on how we can be misled in all innocence or by clever others 
to misinterpret uh, coincidences, to misinterpret our ability and exaggerate it. We're trying to understand how to take better observations sort of out in the real world where we may not have quite so much control over things. There are frequently claims that people can make things materialize. And we know that this has been able to be done by skilled conjurers for years and years and years. The emphasis is on explaining the seemingly paranormal. Here, response times are measured to barely visible threatening and non-threatening pictures. Perhaps we can sense something before we become consciously aware we've seen it. Today's parapsychologists are not easily convinced. The researchers even have some doubts about the existence of Psy itself. I think it's quite possible that Psy may exist as simply a minor feature or variation of our lives. Or it may turn out to have characteristics that really are analogous to the early days of studying electricity, that it is something that can be developed enhanced, built into something much more powerful. We just don't know because we don't know enough about what its operating characteristics might be. Uh, we still have to try to figure out a lot why it really hasn't been around more than it has so far. You know, I think this is a very strong question that can't be underestimated. If psychic functioning is real, why don't we see it more often? We must understand why that is so, and we must always be open, I think, to the possibility that it's not around more often, because in fact, most of the times it's been around, it's really been simulated or faked. So could we demonstrate genuine sigh on television? In New York, we set up a single remote viewing experiment. At the ASPR, Tessa and parapsychologist Keith Harari were recorded by a remote camera. Tessa would simply try to project her mind to a secret location in the city where Dr. Nancy Sondo would be standing. No one has any idea where the doctor's gone, only that she'll be there at 3.15. Nancy should be almost there. So you can focus in on Nancy and what she's experiencing, what she's seeing around her, and the sights and the sounds and the smell or whatever it is. You can just sort of... Um, Imagine yourself with her in a way. What comes to mind about the kinds of things you're experiencing there? It's not noisy. <clears throat> okay. It doesn't seem to be noisy, as if the noise is at a distance. Mm -hmm. um, a path. A path? Yeah, I think. <clears throat> Um, yeah, a path, a concrete path or a gravel path. I think it's like a T. I think it might, there may be a path like that. I think. <laughs> Why don't you um, sort of turn around and look behind you at this place, or even behind Nancy where she is now? I think there's tall trees then. Mm -hmm. But they're not, they're not close, it's just these sort of, if you look up, you can just see the branches coming over. But it's quite tall. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there's a stand down at one at the far end of the path. Um, <clears throat> maybe like a summer stand, a band stand, or something white with railings and a pointed roof. Do you want to draw something about that? You can put it on the same paper or another page, okay. whatever you like. Um, I mean, we have these back home. I have no idea whether you have them here, but just sort of like a, a summer house with steps, like a summer bandstand, and a, a roof um, with railings, I suppose. We must be able to get in somehow, but I don't know where. <clears throat> Quite ornate in white. Um, there might be a statue somewhere there, a tall statue, like a bronze or a metal with a concrete base, can quite you, tall. Uh, can you draw something like that? Or? Um, the 
this is all concrete. This may be lower. I don't know whether there's steps or not. It's either something with it's either something with wings. Oh, it's just, I don't know, what, what it, like an angel or something. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's like a butterfly, it's not a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's like either something with wings and a long robe in that sort of, uh, well, I suppose it would be where the metal turns a sort of greeny, mm -hmm. greeny colour. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm turn around in some new directions. Um, I can see uh, small shops uh, off to the left-hand side. Tell me about that. That's something new. Um, across, sort of out of the park, but it's not that far away. There's like small delis, and one may well looks like it's got a um, a red and white striped canopy mm -hmm. over it. Just a little row of small shops. Tessa drew everything on a single sheet of paper. A T-shaped path, clump of trees, a small building behind a fence, a statue with wings and its base, and a striped awning on a shop across the street. With this drawing to help him, Harari set off around New York. He had to look at four possible locations he'd been given. Only if he matched Tessa's description to the site where Sondo had actually been is the test a success. First location was Lincoln Center. Okay, nothing initially except that it's a peaceful place. No statue. Buildings are fairly large as opposed to the small structure. I don't find this T-shaped walk. Hmm. There are some shops off to the side. There is a sort of red and white awning over there. Okay. No statue, I don't think. No, I'm not very powerfully gripped by this place. It's got some subtle aspects to it, but that's it. So let's go. Let's check out the other stuff. Okay. Okay, we're here at Trump Tower. It's very noisy. It's very crowded. Don't see any statues or any um, T-shaped paths. This would not be number one on my list, that's for sure. So Trump Tower, I would have to put down as um, not very likely. 79th Street Boat Basin. And we do have a path here in a kind of park-like setting, but I don't see anything like this area in here, in this rotunda in her description, in Tessa's description, nor do I see boats or this harbor area or the shoreline. So I would have to say that this is not um, a really strong possibility. Okay, first thing I notice is I come up this path that does come to a kind of a T. There is a statue with wings. Well, it's very hard to ignore having somebody describe a statue with wings and finding a statue with wings. The statue is turning green, and she did mention that the statue had green to it. There is a cement or stone walk here. There are trees around. Take a look over here. There's another small structure over there that could also relate to this. Tessa also described having a, the city sort of surrounding with the street nearby this park-like area and then having shops across the street and a red and white awning, which I see there is a red and white striped awning. And this is more definitely red and white than the sort of um, terracotta shaped one that we saw at Lincoln Center. That's really red and white, no denying that. Um, so we have the trees, the wings, the awning, the stores, the park-like setting the statue, the green on the statue, the sort of small T-shaped walk coming into this place. Um, 
So I am going to, um, I'm going to have to, I mean, there's no choice. I'm going to have to rate this number one um, if I'm going to rank order them. Of course, I've been thinking about this as I've been going along. Um, Lincoln Center would probably be two. Um, the Boat Basin, three, and Trump Tower, four. But this is a big number one. I mean, this, this has so many correspondences that it'll be very interesting if this is not the place. A telephone call to the ASPR confirmed this was the correct site. Nancy Sondo arrived with Tessa, who was not told where she was going. Does this look familiar? Yeah, it looks very familiar. <laughs> what, what, what looks familiar? The wing, it's quiet. That looks Walk up like here. my bandstand. <laughs> you said it was peaceful, like yeah. far. Yeah. Um, you had high trees, tall trees. Yeah. Um, there are some, uh, some wings. <laughs> Okay. Definitely. I said this was that metal that goes green. Oh, you said so that, right. You said the metal went green. Yeah, it's green. And, the, and there aren't a lot of people here. You can hear the city. Oh, I have something else to show you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you see that? That's incredible. <laughs> what do you notice? The shop with the red and white striped awning. Yes. The canopy. Is that something or what? Yeah. The little shops, right? So oh, amazing. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That's that, really... that is incredible. Yeah. Right. There really is a phenomenon. You can demonstrate it experimentally. You can see it happening. Um, but the interpretation is very foggy. It's as if we're back in the 16th century studying electricity. We may not even have the right metaphors to work with. We know that something that we don't understand is going on. It has to do with the physical world. It has to do with um, how consciousness interacts somehow with matter and energy and time. Um, so physics is incomplete. For 300 years, science accepted that physical reality was governed by the cause and effect laws of Sir Isaac Newton. Matter seemingly behaved with the predictability of balls on a billiard table. These mechanistic ideas are in disarray because of quantum physics, the science of matter at the smallest scale. Some paranormal effects might become accepted science if quantum speculations are correct. It's made the whole world seem very mysterious and um, almost unvisualizable. In fact, um, it's incomprehensible even to the scientist, really. All the scientist can do is uh, do calculations and say these calculations uh, predict the results of experiments, but he doesn't have a a clear mental picture of what exactly is going on. Einstein's discoveries earlier this century undermined traditional ideas of reality. Quantum theory, verified by recent experiments in this French laboratory, seemed to demonstrate that matter might be in two places at the same time. Fifty years ago, Einstein wrote about spooky action at a distance. In Psi research, remote viewing tests, the apparent ability to know what is happening somewhere else, seem to have a parallel in quantum physics. You can only explain experimental results if you try and picture a situation at all, if you're prepared to assume that what you do in one place has an influence in the other place. And so therefore it seems that modern science is telling us that distant parts or separated parts of nature are actually connected together in a very mysterious way. There are many things about quantum theory which are, which are puzzling or mysterious. And uh, of course, one of these is that particles can be in two places at once, if you like. But there are also very mysterious effects which seem to indicate that, that you can send signals over large distances in a way which is not constrained by the speed of light. Now, it's not true that you can send signals, but they, as I say, they seem to. What these experiments indicate is that uh, you can't consider s separated objects as, in a sense, being separate from one another. The true nature of the universe is a mystery. Today's physics lacks any overall theory. One quantum speculation is that consciousness is the underlying reality in the universe. The mathematician Sir James Jeans said the universe looked like a great thought. The astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington said the world was made of mind stuff. 
If people have minds as well as brains in a universe made of thought, almost anything becomes possible. There is, I think, evidence within the body of knowledge that has been accumulated that mind can act outside a brain. In other words, one can have influences uh, from one person to another which don't seem to use accepted physical channels. And at the moment, we call that mind. Now, if this turns out to be correct, then quite clearly the world, as we understand it, is a very different place. And it will require two things. Firstly, it will require physics to be rewritten because we're talking about action at a distance. And secondly, it will, it will require a totally different science, a science of consciousness. And that is where we need to go now. Most people believe in a mechanical universe, and quantum theory, while it poses many questions, has few answers. If there is a paranormal dimension to reality, the door may be open to the possibility of life after death, perhaps as a dimension of mind. But most scientists reject the paranormal out of hand. The reaction of a vast number of scientists has been just to say this is nonsense, it's pseudoscience and so on. Um, I think this is a wrong conclusion, and um, we will, in the future, see this kind of thing eventually becoming routine science, um, a sort of thing which, uh, a statement which is often made in this kind of connection is that when something unorthodox comes up, uh, scientists uh, first of all ignore it, and then they say it's nonsense, and then eventually they say it's obvious, it, it was obvious all the time. And I think we'll get that happening in, in the areas that you're exploring in your programs.